Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our Krasno Global event today. Our distinguished guest today is General Ben Hodges. General Hodges already joined us last September, and I'm very pleased to welcome him back to the Krasno events series. Today, we are talking again about Russia's war in Ukraine and should and will Ukraine take back Crimea. General Hodges will help us to assess the current military and strategic situation in that terrible war in Europe, which has now lasted for more than one year. I'm Klaus Lars, and I'm the Richard M. Kresno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. As I'm currently a visiting scholar at the Center for European Studies at Harvard University, right now I'm joining you today from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And here it is miserable with lots of rain and snow and really freezing temperatures. Not nice at all. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm very pleased that once again, we have a very large international audience. Please submit your questions in writing with the help of the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our Krasno assistants, Willow and Jess, will select your questions and read them out aloud to all of us. I'm more than pleased to welcome General Ben Hodges back to the Krasno event series. Ben is one of the world's best military and strategic experts on the Ukraine war, on what is going on there and how to assess the shifting situation on the ground. General Hodges has had a long and highly successful military career in the US Army. He is a former commanding general of the US Army Europe. He served in this role from 2014 to 2017. Prior to this, Ben held senior operational and staff positions in Iraq, Afghanistan, Korea, Turkey, and with the Supreme Allied Commander in Brussels. After leaving the army in 2018, General Hodges held the Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis. He now is a senior advisor to Human Rights First, a nonprofit, nonpartisan international human rights organization. General Hodges also serves as NATO senior, uh, senior mentor for logistics, and he consults for several companies on Europe, NATO, and the European Union. Ben is also the co author of the book Future War and the Defense of Europe, published by OUP in 2021. Today, Ben Hodges. Uh, ben Hodges joins us from Frankfurt in Germany. Thank you, General Hodges, for joining us today. It's great that you could make it again. Much appreciated. Uh, Professor Loris Lieber Klaus, I'm, I'm grateful that you gave me the chance to come back one more time. Absolutely. Now, it's really good to have you here and to have your expertise about what is going on in the Ukraine war. The war began just over a year ago on the 24th of February 2022. What is your assessment of the current military situation in Ukraine? The Russians have had some recent successes. How strong is their military? And will we soon see a Ukrainian counteroffensive? So uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation right now. And if you're a soldier there in and around Bakhmut, for example, or these other places, I mean, it is a level of violence uh, that we haven't seen on this scale uh, since, uh, at least in Europe, since the end of the Second World War. Uh, there was a report that came out yesterday that said Russia's casualties in this first year since their, the beginning of their special military operation surpasses all of their combined casualties in all their wars since the end of the Second World War. So Chechnya, Afghanistan, and all the other places where they've been fighting, they lost more this year than they did in all of those combined. So that gives you an indication of the level of lethality and, and violence. And of course, we've all seen each day the the destruction of uh, Ukrainian infrastructure and uh, attacks on cities, uh, the human misery that's a part of this. Having said that, and that's a, I mean, that's a pretty blunt uh, assessment of what it's like right now. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that Ukraine is going to win this conflict. Uh, Russia um, has so many different problems that we can unpack here um, over the next uh, several minutes. Um, it's not going to be easy, but as long as the West sticks together and provides Ukraine what they need, Ukraine will, in fact, 
win this war. And it's important that they do. I, I would like to just from for appropriate historical context, yes, the special military operation or what some people refer to as the full scale invasion started a year ago, last February. But the war actually began in February of 2014 when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine and seized Crimea, illegally annexed it, and began uh, extensive support for the so-called separatists in the Donbass region. Um, the reason I highlight this, because number one, this is what failed deterrence looks like. The Russians believed that we would not respond, that we would not be able to stick together. They made a terrible miscalculation because of our uh, apparent unpreparedness. You know, we were still dealing with the retreat from Afghanistan. The UK was a mess domestically. Germany was still building Nord Stream 2. And so the Russians, you could almost see how they would think, you know, we didn't do anything after Georgia. We probably would not respond. Um, and we didn't do anything after 2014. So we probably wouldn't really respond or be able to stick together um, if they attacked again this past so would February. You, would, would, if I may interrupt you, would you say the West co committed a serious mistake by being so uh, mild about how they reacted towards jo both Georgia and Crimea in 2014? It was a catastrophic mistake. That's what I'm, this is what failed deterrence looks like. When, when a potential adversary thinks that you're not ready or are not willing, I mean, we know from 5,000 years of history that this is that they will take advantage of that. So that's that's one reason that I wanted to highlight the fact that we have to go back to 2014 in terms of when it started. And then, of course, their uh, annexation of Crimea has given them the most important, decisive part of Ukraine. And, and it changes everything. That give, It gives them an advantage in the economic sphere as well as the uh, military sphere. So um, yes, the special military operation started last February, but I think it's important to have the context. And then finally, there's there still are a lot of good, smart, well-intentioned people that just can't imagine that Ukraine will defeat Russia. It's just too big. But this has been going on for nine years and Russia only controls somewhere between 15 and 20% of Ukraine, despite having all the advantages. And so I think uh, when you take a look at that, after nine years, they still have not sorted out most of their major problems. This is part of the reason why I'm optimistic about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tell us about the strengths of troops and equipment available on both sides. As you rightly said, there's been a lot of uh, destruction and death and wounded. So on both sides, what actually is the existing strength? Yeah, it's hard to know exactly the numbers on the uh, on the Russian side. There's been a lot of headlines about, you know, 500,000 new conscripts and hundreds of thousands of this or that. I don't believe any of those numbers. Um, I think the Russians probably have total, total, somewhere between 250, 300,000 troops involved in this conflict in and around Ukraine, which is more than what they started with, you'll remember. So they have gone through a couple of iterations of uh, mobilizations, uh, increased conscription, um, Wagner Group in particular, the private military company um, led by Mr. Prigozhin. Um, has emptied the prisons. Uh, so they have gotten up, I think, somewhere in that range. But that's just raw numbers. That does not equal real combat power. Um, it's hard to say how many um, their casualties are. You know, the Ukrainian general staff puts out every day what they think the number is. And they put, I think it's somewhere around 135,000 killed. And then another tens of thousands that are wounded of, of Russians. Um, I don't, I never trust numbers from anybody, even from my own soldiers, um, just because uh, there's so many ways that numbers, that these kind of things, the way they get reported, um, especially on that scale. So uh, even if you cut it in half though, I mean, that's enormous amount of loss of life. Uh, the BBC put out a, uh, uh, a map a couple of days ago, it's fascinating, that shows um, the distribution of where all these soldiers, the dead Russians, originated. 
And you won't be surprised to learn that I'm a zero uh, from Moscow. Uh, mm -hmm. The vast majority of their casualties are happening out in the um, far eastern part of the Russian Federation uh, or the ethnic areas and the poor areas. Almost no families in Moscow are going to any funerals. I do trust the numbers that I see on, on vehicles because uh, British intelligence and organizations like Oryx and Bellingcat, they only credit a destroyed vehicle um, if they have, they can have a photograph and can geolocate where it's at. So the numbers I do generally trust. On the Ukrainian side, um, the uh, um, numbers are, I'm certain they've, they've lost tens of thousands of soldiers killed uh, and wounded. There's no, just given the nature of the combat and the intensity of it, um, not so many as the Russians, but nonetheless, a huge number of casualties. Um, but they do a good job, I will say, uh, on two things. One, their medical evacuation uh, has improved dramatically over the past few years, and especially this year. Whereas on the Russian side, you see almost no attempt to do what we would recognize as medical evacuation, battlefield treatment. So I suspect that the Russian died of wounds rate is significantly higher than it is for uh, the Ukrainian side. On the other hand, I have no idea how many they really have um, because Ukrainian general staff is very, very disciplined about protecting information. So I don't know how many troops they have. I don't know how many actual casualties they've had. Um, but in a war of attrition, they still have about 2 million women and men of military age that are prepared to step forward. So I don't think we're going to see Ukraine running out of people. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You were just uh, gone. Your audio was gone for a minute. Um, what about the Western tanks and even jet fighters, which have been increasingly mentioned in the last few weeks? Will uh, First of all, do you think they will actually be committed? There was a report in the New York Times today that uh, Western nations seem to be very hesitant to actually follow up on their promises and uh, send tanks to Ukraine. And uh, will, will it make a difference? Uh, it will make a difference. And they are I'm showing sorry. up. Hmm. Am, I, am I coming through? How are you come through? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, um, they, they will make a difference. Um, they are arriving. Uh, the, the U.S. tanks are going to come way late. And I think this was by design or whatever. But the solution that the U.S. chose for this means that these will be tanks that won't arrive probably till the very till the end of the year. Um, so they won't be a factor, except in that I think this was done deliberately by the administration to enable the Germans to go ahead and agree to provide the Leopards. So 31 Abrams tanks, that's a battalion in the uh, organizational structure for the Ukrainian army. And they will get put into the fight at some point, but uh, nonetheless, they will, um, they will uh, not be a factor this summer. The German Leopards, of course, which are coming not only from Germany, but also from Poland and uh, other countries, these will make a difference. Um, the, the Leo uh, is a very, very good tank. And of course, as you know, the, um, the uh, uh, crew, that's what makes the difference. It's, do you have the, 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 women, the women and men in these vehicles, are they trained to operate effectively? They will be able to defeat anything that the Russians can put on the battlefield. What is already arriving in numbers are the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles, uh, German Martyrs, uh, and other uh, you know, infantry fighting vehicles that are necessary as part of a combined arms team. So um, I suspect that what we'll see is by June, when the Ukrainians launch what I would anticipate will be a significant counteroffensive uh, in the southeasterly direction towards Azov Sea, um, probably towards Mariupol or Melitopol, for the purpose of, of breaking the land bridge, 
uh, they will have at least three or four brigades of their own equipment, Ukrainian tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, as well as the huge number that they captured from the Russians. And then there's probably a brigade, which is two to 3,000 troops, a uh, hundred or so uh, tanks, and a couple hundred infantry fighting vehicles that, that, con that make up this what you could call a European brigade made up of the French, the German, the British and American armored vehicles. That's consequential. And that, that will be enough, I believe, to be able to penetrate Russian defenses on a, on a very narrow front in, in June. But will the Russians also get support from other countries? For example, from Belarus, will they get involved in the war? What about Iranian drones and other commitments? Even now there's talk that the Chinese may uh, uh, send military equipment to Russia. Do you believe that that is correct? Um, okay, so there's two or three things here. First of all, one of the reasons I am so optimistic about Ukraine's chances is that they have 52 countries supporting them, okay? Uh, Russia has the ones you just named. Iran is providing drones, which is, a, which is really a, a comment in and of itself that Russia has to import drones from Iran. I mean, that tells you that their defense industry is in, in bad shape. Sanctions are, are having an effect. Uh, North Korea... I think is providing some things, but I, I can't tell for sure. Uh, probably artillery ammunition. Um, and I had heard that they were also providing winter clothing, which is another statement that North Korea would have to provide winter clothing to Russian troops. Um, Belarus is, a um, to me, I, I haven't quite figured it out. I think Lukashenko is continuing to do what he's always done, which is to try and play this uh, role of to do just enough to keep the Kremlin happy by, in this case, allowing Russians to stage there, to launch attacks from there. But he's not, and he has provided ammunition and equipment to Russia for use elsewhere. But I don't think we're going to see any of his 10 battalions fed into the fight because their level of readiness is going to be worse uh, or no better than what the Russians have. And I think he knows that they will be decimated once they get into the fight. And I think also he may be concerned that they won't actually fight because um, they don't have the same sort of animosity or the reason between uh, Belarus and Ukraine that, that Russia has. Um, but he also, of course, is going to be worried that uh, about getting annexed by Russia. So I think he'll have to continue to play that, uh, that game. Interestingly, um, as I had hoped and anticipated, the partisans, if you will, inside Belarus are um, just launched a strike yesterday that, that severely damaged, uh, maybe permanently, one of Russia's seven um, air, um, it would be the equivalent to our AWACS, which is an aircraft that flies and, and has the, the gigantic dish on top of it um, that is able to provide a mobile um, aerial picture for organizing your air forces. Well, one of them was on the runway in Minsk and uh, the uh, partisans were able to hit it with a drone and that thing is can't fly anymore, at least not for a while. So I expect to see a lot more of those things. Finally, to China, um, I, I thought it was, it was significant that Secretary Blinken made a public announcement while he was there at Munich saying that we know that the Chinese are considering providing lethal aid. Now, if somebody like Secretary Blinken to say that means that he they have hard intelligence that would say that. And so I think by announcing it the way he did, it had the same effect as when the US and UK started releasing intelligence about Russia a year ago that put the Russians on their heels. And now China is in the position of having to deny that they're doing this. And, and so it kind of puts them on notice. I think China would like to see us fail. They don't want to see the Russian Federation collapse. Um, and they're watching to see, can we stick to it to help Ukraine um, as they consider their own options in the Indo-Pacific region? 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Last time we talked, you dismissed the likelihood of Putin using tactical nuclear weapons, or at least you didn't, you weren't convinced that he would. Is that still your view or has that changed in a way? Uh, I'm even more convinced that he will not use uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and the reason, now let me obviously uh, be clear that we take that threat seriously. Uh, they have thousands of nuclear warheads, strategic and tactical. Um, he, they clearly don't care how many innocent people they kill. But I think that um, they take seriously President Biden's warning that there would be catastrophic consequences for Russia if they were to use any kind of nuclear weapon. I think they take that seriously. And from a practical standpoint, there is no... Um, battlefield advantage for Russia to use a tactical nuclear weapon. I mean, it won't it won't change anything on the ground except it kills a few more innocent people, damages a few more um, uh, buildings and towns, but it won't change anything on the ground. So um, I think that people around Putin realize this: if there's that there's no there's no good outcome for them in anything once they use it. As long as they don't use it though, they can see that we are very, very concerned. So we're we're kind of we're kind of on the margins of uh, giving in to nuclear blackmail. So this this is a very important part of this war. Um, Pakistan, India, Israel, China, North Korea, Iran, everybody that has a nuke or is working towards getting one will see that the U.S. is unwilling, that we stop short of, of providing F-16s or certain weapons just because we're worried that Russia might escalate. That would be a very dangerous situation. So I think the administration is eventually going to push through all that. And um, simultaneously, we should be communicating directly, and maybe they are privately, directly to all the elites, all the people around Putin, telling them, if he uses a nuclear, if he, if you enable or tolerate or allow him to use a nuclear weapon, then all of you are going to hang as well. After the war crimes tribunal finishes their job, you're going to be up there on the gallows with him. They need to feel there is no impunity for them. Mm -hmm. Would you say the same applies to uh, biological and chemical weapons, or is that a different ballgame? Um, you know, I haven't heard the uh, the president make a statement that specific but um i would i would anticipate well first i would say there is again there is no battlefield advantage there probably would be a devastating consequence against russian forces inside ukraine not inside russia but inside ukraine and i think i think the general staff um sees that mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at Putin and his changing war plans, what have what are his aims by now? What are his latest war aims? Because he must have some aims. Well, everything that I see that comes from Kremlin spokespeople uh, and President Medvedev or former President Medvedev and these guys, they keep saying he nothing's changed. Everything's going according to plan. We've not changed any of our war aims, so or any of our aims. Um, so I would say it's still uh, at least publicly stated, you know, um, to um, to his own public, they're defending against NATO. I mean, that's that's the narrative that they've created now that that Russia is under attack from NATO, which, of course, is a totally false narrative. But that's they're having to um, sell this to their own to their own public. Um, I think actually what they want is to um, have control over uh, the four oblasts that they have annexed um, here in recent months, the uh, uh, Zaporizhia, Kherson, Luhansk, and Donetsk, in addition to Crimea, which they had already illegally annexed. Get control of all that and then say, okay, we're ready for a ceasefire and then be able to I mean, that would be um, uh, something that they could point to as, look, look what we did. This is a success. We denazified these areas, and they would still control Crimea if that was the end game. And I, I think that's probably, 
if they're honest with themselves, that that's probably the best that they could hope for. Mm -hmm, thanks. You are based in Frankfurt in Germany, and the German Chancellor has, of course, been exposed to a lot of criticism for his hesitant, reluctant, uh, uh, hesitating uh, situation regarding providing aid to Ukraine. But the Germans themselves say they are providing actually an awful lot. That is highly unfair criticism. How do you see the evolving situation in Germany? Well, the fact is Germany is the number two or three provider of military aid to Ukraine in terms of equipment, supplies, ammunition, all sorts of different things. I mean, there, um, when I saw that Germany provided a, a Patriot battery, that was huge. Um, or the uh, Iris T air defense system. Um, the, you know, they finally made the decision on Leopards. They have provided Martyrs, the infantry fighting vehicle. Uh, the Panzer Havitzer 2000, which is the self-propelled um, howitzer and thousands of rounds of ammunition. This is a lot of stuff. And when you think about where they were a year ago, when the former defense minister talked about sending 5,000 helmets, I mean, um, they, they have come a very long way. The problem is the messaging. Um, I would bet that 95% of my fellow Frankfurters here have no idea that Germany is the number two or number three donor. To, it's, I think Berlin still lacks the self-confidence to talk openly about, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, and so I have heard Chancellor Schultz say publicly last uh, November, December at the Berlin Security Conference, you know, we're with Ukraine for as long as it takes. He stood right next to the Norwegian uh, prime minister who said the same thing. And, uh, oh, okay, well, that's that's pretty good. Uh, but but now that phrase is starting to wear a little bit thin. I mean, for as long as what takes. I mean, you know, they they, they still stop short, as does my president, of saying we want Ukraine to win, and we're going to help. We're going to do everything necessary for Ukraine to win. Um, mm -hmm. I think that finally, uh, internally, Germany also. Uh, I, I I took great heart at the famous Zeitenwende speech last February, 100 billion euro and, and all that. But actually, almost none of that has been spent yet. And they just this last month or earlier this month dropped the first contract for new stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not because Chancellor Schultz was being dishonest. It's because the entire apparatus has got to go through a massive site and venda. It's not just a decree by the chancellor's office. It's you know, the bureaucracy, the the ability to spend money to do what needs to be done is, is not there. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the United States, isn't it still geography which defines the situation and the position towards the war? With uh, France in particular, but also Germany perhaps being more reluctant than, let's say, Poland, the Baltic states and countries much closer to uh, Russia. Isn't that decisive? Well, uh, certainly um, our allies in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania uh, take this much more uh, with a high, much greater sense of urgency than do Germany and, and France, for example. Um, but I have heard President Macron, even he's talking about winning now. Uh, the German defense minister Pistorius, the new defense minister, who I think is a significant uh, improvement for Germany. He even talked about winning. Um, so it, there, there is a disparity, but it's not quite so stark. Certainly Sweden and Finland have demonstrated their concern and their sense of urgency by applying for membership in NATO, which, I, by the way, I do think this will eventually happen. I don't know if it'll happen in time for the, the uh, NATO summit in Vilnius in July. I hope it does, but this, this is frankly depends on Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, UK, they've had a sense of urgency from the beginning, and they're as far away as anybody uh, from the actual proximity. I listened to uh, Prime Minister uh, Kallis of Estonia um, at the Munich Security Conference, or maybe it was another conference before that, and somebody had made the comment that, uh, come on, you know, the, the Russians, they only got this far and then they eventually had to pull back. And she goes, yes, this was after Bucha. She goes, yes, that's true. 
but the, the land that they did take in those first two weeks equals the size of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. So even though they were eventually defeated and pushed back, in a couple of weeks, the Russians did capture the equivalent amount of terrain. And so for them, that means, and we see what happens in towns that the Russians overrun. So uh, for them, that they they are uh, they know that this is about life and death for them if they're that close to Russia. Mm -hmm. There are increasing calls almost everywhere, including the Western world, for peace talks. That the two sides should really get together and begin talking to end the carnage. And recently, the Chinese came out with their so-called peace plan, and they called for the same initiative. Do you think it is time to talk, or is it too premature, or is it even impossible to talk right now? Well, that Chinese offer um, lasted about an hour and a half, I think. I mean, it, they had no credibility because it was also within the context of, you know, they're looking to give weapons to, to Russia uh, or ammunition. You know, so this is a permanent member of the UN Security Council offering to backfill ammunition that Russia has used to kill innocent people. So they, they just don't have any credibility. And it wasn't really a peace plan as much as it was a list of possible uh, considerations, but President Zelensky said, "Oh, there's two or three things in here that we that we would agree with, uh, such as uh, Russia having to withdraw." Um, so, uh, I think right now uh, there's very, very little likelihood of any serious peace discussions. I think the Kremlin doesn't want it yet. They they don't, they don't want to uh, get engaged, not in a meaningful way, until they think they can um, have what it is they really want. Um, and I think on the Crimean, on the Ukrainian side, I mean, why? What's in it for them? That they, I think, they probably have ninety-eight percent of the population say absolutely we're going to keep fighting. I mean, they, they've lost a lot, and to and to roll over now, I think it would be impossible um, for President Zelensky uh, to do that. And frankly, I don't think they should. Uh, Russia has done nothing to earn any credibility as a reliable negotiating partner. I mean, any, any deal with them, you should start with the premise that they're not gonna live up to it unless you've got a real compliance protocol in place. And I think, uh, you know, most of these offers and dis discussions kind of begin with the idea of, for the sake of peace, for the love of God, let them have Crimea, which would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Do you see any uh, uh, slowing and weakening of resolve in the United States, perhaps in the American Congress, among the American population? Voices saying the war is getting too expensive. Let's spend the money at home rather than on Ukraine. Well, uh, certainly we, there is a segment of American uh, society um, that has always been isolationist. I mean, there were people that were against the U.S. getting involved in World War II. Um, so that that there's always going to be a piece of that, but um, I think those are the extreme on the fringes. Um, at the Munich Security Conference, was the largest congressional delegation that has ever been there. More than fifty members, Republican and Democrat. Uh, I listened to Senator Mitch McConnell, the Republican uh, Senate leader, who uh, um, spoke at the CSU's. Transatlantic Forum, which is always kind of one of the kickoff events there for the Munich Security Conference. And he stood up and said, hey, look, the reason I'm here with a very large Republican delegation is to disabuse everybody of the notion that somehow the Republican Party doesn't care about Europe, NATO, or Ukraine. We are here because we do care about Europe, NATO, and Ukraine. And he was, without saying it, of course, he was trying to create some separation from the crazies uh, on, the, on the far right. Um, so that that got my attention. And both North Carolina senators uh, were there, by the way. I, I, I saw both of them as part of this delegation. I listened to the chairman, the Republican, uh, Mr. McCall from Texas, who's chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee. He, he is all in. He's putting pressure on the administration to do more. So I think for now, certainly throughout the rest of this year, we're going to continue to see very strong bipartisan support for helping uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's talk about Crimea. Crimea, in a way, has a unique position. 
And a lot of people say that Crimea should be granted to Russia because uh, the, the population on the Crimea, even before the war, was largely pro-Russian rather than pro-Ukrainian. And um, there is pressure to, to do something about uh, uh, Crimea. On the other hand, the question arises, why haven't the Ukrainians attacked that land bridge leading to uh, Crimea and interrupted the flow of Russian goods, even uh, soldiers, uh, uh, from Crimea into the battlefield? So uh, three or four important points in your uh, question, Klaus. First of all, the, the demographics of the population of Crimea is a total artificial creation. Now, as you know, over the decades, Russia has been uh, redistributing the population, deporting Tartars and, and others, and bringing in uh, Russians. So I, I don't know that I would use this as the metric as, well, all the Crimeans want to be part of Russia. Plus, I don't, I don't think any of you, including you, actually trust any referendum that was conducted while Russian troops are standing there. So, um, but but we'll we'll know better uh, in a few months once once uh, Ukraine does in fact liberate Crimea, but the uh, significance of Crimea I think has been underappreciated. It kind of does get written off by people saying, "Oh, there's a special historical, whatever you know." Or I've even had a very very well educated uh, German professor. I mean, it was Professor Doctor Doctor, one of those super educated guys. And he said, come on, Ben, Crimea has always been Russian. I said, oh, Herr Professor, I mean, that would be quite a shock to the uh, Tartars. Uh, and, and since it was Catherine the Great that first took Crimea at the end of the 18th century. So, um, yes, uh, of course, it has a symbolic um, meaning for Putin. I mean, he's he's pretty much staked his personal reputation on this. His popularity went up back in 2014 when uh, they took Crimea. Um, so for him, it has important significance. But I remember last summer, as I imagine most of the people listening to this will remember, when uh, a bunch of Russians were down at the beach on the Western Crimea uh, for their summer holiday, and all of a sudden explosions started occurring at the big Russian air base at Saki, there coast, close to the Western coast. There was a massive style of 30,000 cars trying to get out of there over the next 24 hours. So that didn't look to me like Crimea was so holy to them. If it was, they would have all gone to the re military recruiting office and signed up right there to defend Crimea. Of course, they it was a holy holiday place for them. Now, um, I think that uh, Crimea is the decisive terrain for this war. Uh, and I say it's decisive because as long as Russia occupies Crimea, Ukraine will never be able to rebuild their economy. Um, Russia will continue to block ships from going in and out of Azov Sea so that even after Mariupol and Berdansk are liberated, those two factory towns, port, port cities, will never be able to come back to life because Russia controls the Kerch Straits. Uh, on the Odessa side, you know, there's over 100 ships loaded with grain that are sitting there waiting to go, but they can't leave until a Russian inspector, you know, looks around with a flashlight and then checks them off and allows them to go. That's only possible because Russia has the Black Sea Fleet sitting there in Sevastopol. So um, it represents a an inability for Ukraine to rebuild its economy. It represents a security threat because of their ability to launch missiles, aircraft, ships, anywhere up and down the Ukrainian Black Sea Coast. And what's really important, um, I spoke to a very, 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 that's three various senior uh, director of one of the two largest international investment firms. And he said, when I was at Munich, and he said, there will be no investment in Ukraine unless there is an ironclad security guarantee. And, and Ukraine will never be secure as long as Russia occupies Crimea, which means there will be no Marshall Plan. There will be no rebuilding of of Ukraine. And so that means four plus million Ukrainian refugees will continue to live in Germany and Poland and Netherlands and everywhere else because they have nothing to which they can go back. So this is this is strategic. Donbass is important, but you could you could kill every Russian in Donbass 
then that would not change the outcome. Liberating Crimea, that changes the outcome. You said that the Ukrainians will liberate Crimea in the next few months. How are they going to do that? And why are you so optimistic that they will actually be successful? Well, of course, there is a gigantic caveat next to that prediction. The caveat is that we provide the Ukrainians what they need, which is long range precision weapons. So if you imagine in your mental map, uh, Crimea, there's only two roads, two land routes, or what we would call a line of communication that connect Crimea to Russia. One is over the Kerch Bridge, which was hit last fall, of course, and I anticipate the Ukrainians will revisit that uh, again. The other one is the so-called land bridge that connects uh, Crimea to Russia via Melitopol and Mariupol. So, uh, and so what you want have to do is isolate Crimea first by severing those two lines of communication. We've already mentioned the Kerch Bridge. The way you sever the land bridge is what they're doing already. They're starting to hit um, the uh, bridge at Melitopol, which they can reach um, with some systems, but not enough. Uh, so that's a, an, an attempt to begin disrupting, disrupting that line of communication. But also, I think this armored force that they are building up um, will be used probably, my guess is June, when you've got um, ideal weather conditions and they and this these brigades that they have been uh, building will have had the chance to train and practice and be ready to launch their attack. That will sever that land bridge. And now you're in a position where you can start bringing up more HIMARS and begin to make the Crimean Peninsula untenable. So don't think of a big blue arrow of infantry assaulting across that very narrow Paracup Isthmus, that, that would be very, very difficult. Instead, think of um, how they are going to make it untenable. You know, you have this famous uh, North Crimean Canal that diverts water from the uh, Dnipro River. Uh, for sure, uh, they're going to cut that again um, to turn off water going in there. I mean, this is like medieval siege warfare. You turn off the water, you isolate it, and then you bring up the, the siege howitzers, which are high marks. Um, now, what they have so far has a range of 90 kilometers. That's not that's not long enough. So that we have got to get them other capabilities that would allow them to reach out to 150, 200, 300 kilometers. That means a TACOMS, which is the 300 kilometer rocket that's also fired off of High Mars, or the Gray Eagle drone, which carries Hellfire missiles and can loiter for about 25 hours. Uh, something called the ground launched small diameter bomb, which you have started providing, or they will be provided, that have a range of 150 kilometers. And then I think the UK is going to provide something called Storm Shadow, which also has uh, around 100 or so kilometer range. These are the capabilities. Now, people say, what about F-16? Yeah, I'm all for it. We, we should have done that months ago. But for me, it's not the platform or the system it's the capability that matters. So I don't care how they do it. There are several different weapons that could be provided to achieve that effect we're talking about of isolation and then making it untenable so that the Russian Navy cannot operate from Sevastopol. The Russian Air Force cannot fly out of there. And so that's, that's how you set the conditions for Ukraine liberating Crimea before the end of August. Two, two questions. Why hasn't the water and the electricity already been cut off? That should have been possible even without a full-scale uh, liberation and invasion. Secondly, if you use these long or give the Ukrainians this long-range uh, capability, uh, including missiles, how can you be sure that the Ukrainians will not use it against Russia proper, St. Petersburg, Moscow, and you know what I mean? Yeah. So on the water, I don't know the exactly why they haven't already done that. Um, obviously, they're aware of it because they, they blocked it in 2014. And then when the Russians captured Kherson, they were able to unblock it. So um, I, I don't know, I don't have enough fidelity on the ground of, is this something that could be done with a with weapons? 
or would you have to have actual boots on the ground engineer capability? I, I don't know that. That's a, that's a, a good question. Uh, I'm sure that the general staff will have thought through that. Um, as far as long range weapons used inside Russia, um, first of all, the, the Zelensky government has already said they wouldn't do it. I mean, if that's a condition for the US to give them a tackles, for example, they've already said, we, we have more than enough targets in Crimea and in Donbass um, that we would rather be hitting anyway versus um, using these precious few attackums against a, a Russian airfield somewhere deep inside Belgorod or, or something like that. Now, of course, today, uh, they already use their own drones to hit a Gazprom terminal um, several hundred kilometers southeast of, of um, Crimea. So, and then there was one, I think they hit a target or crash landed about 60 miles south of Moscow. So, so the Ukrainians are not sitting on their hands. I mean, this Ukraine was the defense, the heart of defense industry of the Soviet Union. So they have technology, they have engineers, they know how to do stuff. Um, but I think this is a, uh, uh, they, they would not use, because it would be so easy for us to turn it off. I mean, we would know they did it. And I think the Ukrainians have, uh, would much rather have these things to help them inside Ukraine, uh, no matter how good it would feel to put an attack them right in the middle of a big, giant, fat Russian air base somewhere else. Thank you. So how is this war going to end? All wars end, and this war will need to end. Who is going to win, to be the winner, the loser, and above all, how do we get an end uh, uh, and an armistice? How do, you, how, how do we get there? So uh, this is a very important question. Uh, and and I, would, I would say that the Biden administration has done a superb job on so many facets of this conflict, keeping everybody together. We have delivered huge amounts of capability to Ukraine. Uh, so there's so many positives, but we still are failing um, the U.S. and so are our allies to, to provide clarity on the, on the outcome that we want. I mean, to say we're in it for as long as it takes, which is what the vice president said in Munich, that's not, a, that's not an end state. That's a statement of resolve, but that's not an end state. That doesn't accelerate delivery of what's needed. It doesn't um, provide clarity for commanders who are trying to figure out what to do. Um, you know, we went through 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, and no president ever said we're going to win. And we, we see how Afghanistan turned out. You have to, you have to give clarity, and that's what drives everything else. So the administration has got to decide how we want this to end. I think they want it to end with Ukraine winning, but they are overly concerned about possible Russian nuclear escalation. And I think China has something to do with this. I think the Chinese are, are putting a lot of pressure on there or maybe, but of course, I, I don't know that. But because of that, the, we continue to deter ourselves and we stop short of giving things as quickly as they should have been provided. Um, and it's affecting our policy um, decision process and that's why we're doing things so incrementally rather than saying, here's everything that's needed. Let's get it done. It, I believe it could end this year. If we decided this would be the quickest way to end the killing is to help Ukraine win this year. Um, but, but I don't think the administration is there yet. But what do we mean by winning? How, in what way is Ukraine supposed to win? Yeah, this is easy. So the, the desired end state should be Ukraine regains sovereignty over all of its territory, all of its legal borders. Including Crimea. Of course. Everybody in the world except Moscow and maybe uh, Pyongyang acknowledges that this is sovereign Russian or Ukrainian territory. So, yes. Number two, uh, there are thousands of, of Ukrainian children that have been deported over the past few years. Um, they, they all have to be brought back. Number three, uh, accountability for war crimes. I mean, Russia acts with absolute total, at least they seem to think they have total impunity. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we see it every day. Missile strikes, there's probably another one that's going to be happening tonight, um, hitting apartment buildings and uh, shopping centers and power grid. 
mean, this these are these are war crimes, um, and and the others are are well documented of the killing of people in so many different towns that the Russians had occupied, and then the the broader crime of war of aggression. So that's why getting a tribunal in place uh, is so important, so that the Russians know that they're uh, uh, are not going to have impunity. The fourth condition has got to be some sort of security guarantee. Otherwise, as I said earlier, there, there will be no reconstruction. So these are the four sort of uh, key uh, elements of Ukraine winning. Thank you. What about the future of Putin and Russia? There's increasing concern. Well, some people are relieved about it that Russia may break up while others are severely concerned about that prospect. Do you believe there's something in that? Have you heard anything about it? Um, I, I do believe that there is a very real possibility that the Russian Federation could begin to break apart um, next year, uh, depending on how, you know, what happens in Crimea, what happens on the other side. You know, when, when you look at these, uh, the characters over there, you have Prigozhin who spends, uh, most of his time doing TikTok, uh, visiting his, his own troops and criticizing Shoigu and Gerasimov, the defense minister and the chief of the Russian general staff. I mean, very publicly. Uh, and I think he sees himself either as the, the, the savior for Putin or the successor. Uh, but clearly um, he uh, feels no allegiance to the general staff and he complains that they are you know, screwing him over, that they don't provide him what he needs. I think actually the Russian general staff hopes he fails. They would rather see him fail than their own guys succeed because he is such a pain to them. Um, but he's still got Wagner troops all over Africa and uh, they're guarding uh, gold mines, diamond mines. That's that's how he finances his whole operation. Then you've got Kadyrov, the uh, leader of the Chechens. Um, the Ukrainians refer to them as the TikTok army because there's always video of them standing around with their vehicles on parade and all that, but you don't ever see video of dead Chechens. So I think Kadyrov is somehow keeping his guys out of the worst part of the fighting so that either they are in position to break away a third Chechen war, if you will, or um, maybe he sees himself showing up just in time to be the savior. I don't know. But fortunately for Ukraine and fortunately for us, the Russians have still, after nine years, not managed to establish a coherent command and control structure that can unify all the different advantages that Russia should normally have because these guys hate each other so much. And this is why I think there is a possibility of some of the 85 or so republics and areas and other entities that make up the Russian Federation. Of course, there will always be a Russia, but the Russian Federation consists of 80 plus other entities out there. And um, I'm not sure all of them want to remain a part of what once was the Russian empire. So if, if Crimea is lost, then I think it would be very, very unlikely that Putin would still be in power. Would you welcome the breakup of the Russian Federation? It it would concern me. I mean, I think it it could be a natural outcome of this. I mean, the British Empire broke up. You know, everybody's except Russia. Everybody's empire eventually comes apart. Now it can be peaceful or it can be extremely violent. Um, so I I don't like the phrase regime change because you know we have our own experience in the U.S. with regime change and it never works out the way you think it will. So this is something that's for the Russian people to decide. Uh, but we should, uh, you can't dismiss it out of hand. We should be thinking about well, what are the implications? What happens to all these nuclear weapons? What happens to the uh, control of the energy infrastructure? Uh, there will be violence as um, certain regions see that maybe this is their chance to finally get out from under the yoke of the Kremlin. Um, but I would not be scared of it. Uh, and, and we should not be scared that whoever comes after Putin might be worse. I, I can't imagine anybody that would be worse. So we, we should not be scared of that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a couple of more questions and then we open it up to questions from uh, our audience. 
The first one would be what, in your view, are the geopolitical uh, implications already uh, of the Ukraine war? Think of the global south, India, think of Central Asia, think of Taiwan and China. What, uh, how do you see that um, these consequences of the Ukraine war? Well, from a uh, um, geostrategic perspective, uh, we see what failed deterrence looks like. I mean, we, we've been reminded what we've known from thousands of years of history that if there is a an aggressor out there or a, an autocrat or a dictator, if they see opportunity, they're they're going to exploit it. And and we failed to react properly after 2008 and 2014, and so here we are. So that's uh, that's one thing that is uh, a major takeaway for me. Uh, we've also been reminded that not everybody sees the inherent beauty and value of supporting Ukraine. I mean, there are a lot of countries in Africa, almost every country in Africa either abstained or voted in favor of Russia in the recent UN uh, General Assembly uh, non-binding uh, statement. Because, you know, they, they see opportunity, advantage, or profit when Russia or China operates and, and brings, brings investment even if it results in these terrible debt traps, the, the fact is we have not consistently invested or worked hard enough to, um, with the, to have the relationships necessary in Africa and in some other parts of the of Middle East and, and Asia. Uh, I think it's probably been a little bit of a surprise that India um, has uh, and Brazil have not been um, uh, more pro-West because each of them has their own geopolitical uh, issues with which they have to deal as well. Um, Iran is, uh, is for me, this is well beyond my expertise. I mean, they, they have got a terrible situation at home. I, these incredibly brave women that are continue to protest out there despite a crackdown, that's still, I mean, this is still going on. It's not getting the same coverage it was, and maybe it's not on the same scale, but it's, that's still going on. So Iran doubling down on, on the crackdown of them and handcuffing themselves to Russia, I can only believe that they have um, been given some sort of indication from Moscow that will help them accelerate their nuclear development, that there's some kind of huge uh, advantage for them uh, to, to do this, because obviously they're not winning any friends. Um, and, and then finally, of course, China um, is, is in such a, an important role here as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, they've been caught with their hand in the cookie jar, planning to provide weapons to uh, Russia. We'll see if President Biden said he didn't think the Russia was going to go through with it, and I would agree with him on that. Um, but they're watching closely to see how much resolve and steal the, the West has. I mean, are we willing to see it through to help Ukraine defeat Russia? Are we really serious about defending all of our values, sovereignty, uh, international law, freedom of navigation, human rights? Are we really serious about that? And if not, then I think uh, China will, will see that um, they could pretty much almost do whatever they want in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. You've been retired for a few years from active military service. So do you miss that you're not uh, active right now in this very uh, important situation? Every day I wish <laughs> that I was uh, either with our soldiers uh, as they train and prepare and, and we were doing their NATO jobs, you know, of deterrence and defense. And then also to be able to go in and out of Ukraine to see for myself, uh, you know, what's going on to help us understand so how we could be more helpful. Of course, I, I miss that. But there are people younger, fitter, and smarter than I am that are uh, in charge now. And so it was, it was it's time for me to uh, have stepped aside. I'm really impressed with uh, General Cavoli, the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, General Williams, the Commander of U.S. Army Europe, and the others what they're doing um, and, and Americans can be very proud of the, of, of these uh, leaders. I tell you what I do miss Klaus. I really miss 
having the uh, communications guy following me around. I mean, I used to always have this sergeant that was a, an IT expert everywhere I went. He was with me or she was with me because, you know, on this phone here, I am, uh, let's just say I'm not literate on, on most modern communication <laughs> systems. So I really miss having that sergeant with me. Thank you. We have plenty of questions from our online audience. Uh, Willow, would you uh, be so kind to ask the first uh, question? I'm sure there are plenty of interesting questions. There are quite a few. Um, let's start with this one. Uh, a couple people actually um, have asked about uh, the apparent hesitation on the part of the U.S. to provide missiles and other military support to Ukraine. Um, and what they ask is, what is the American motive in all of this? So th this is the most frustrating thing for me, and I think it stems from the fact that we we can't say we want Ukraine to win, or we have stopped short of saying that, and therefore uh, we find reasons or uh, concerns of why we don't want to perhaps provoke Russia. I mean, that's that's how it comes out. Or they'll say we don't have enough for ourselves. That I've heard that as a reason or justification for not providing the attackums, for example. Or on the M1 tanks, well, it'll take too long to train. It's a it's a maintenance problem. And and all the, I mean, so all these things start sounding like excuses. And I think it really boils down to we have it, we don't have the clarity of, of how we want this to end. If we did, I mean, we wouldn't be having all these debates about you know, what kind of fuel does the M1 tank? I mean, as I listened to all the discussions about M1 tanks, I started wondering, well, why the hell do we have them if there's so many problems with them? Uh, and, and it's obvious that these were being put out as excuses rather than policy justification. So I think it has to do with concern of provocation uh, and concern, do we have enough um, if we got into a conflict with China? Thank you. Jess? Yes, we have another question. If Crimea is non-negotiable, does that mean that this war has been fought to or it has to be fought to complete victory, or do you see room for negotiations centering around other issues such as NATO, NATO membership? So uh, this is a really an excellent question, and I think a lot of good people are trying to figure out a way to, um, is there some path to a, a negotiated uh, conclusion that um, um, is acceptable um, at this point? I don't see that, but I could imagine at some point, um, but let me back up. It, I mean, it has always been a principle of the alliance that uh, nations get to make their own choices, that Russia is, does not get veto authority over who joins NATO. So um, I think to offer up that, okay, we promise Ukraine will never join NATO um, would be a a a break with a long-standing policy. And also, that's not why Russia went into Ukraine. They, they, they weren't worried about Ukraine joining NATO. What they really are worried about is Ukraine being in the European Union and becoming um, so, so successful economically and the quality of life going up. And, and so to have a, a large, booming, successful liberal democracy on the border of Russia is, is something that Putin uh, could not possibly tolerate. So the NATO thing, I, I always thought that that was a, uh, a uh, part of the fairy tale narrative. Uh, now, I have heard people say, well, what if, what if Crimea had some sort of special status where Russia would leave it, but Ukraine would not put troops on there? Um, that, that on the surface, that says, hmm, Okay, well, that might answer the problem of Ukraine's economy and so on. But then you but then you wake up and realize Russia has violated so many agreements uh, about that region already. Why should we all of a sudden expect that now they would live up to any agreement? So unless there was a massive peacekeeping force provided by multiple nations, I, I can't imagine. And, and then again, why should Russian aggression be rewarded. Uh, that Kerch Bridge would still be there. So if Crimea had neutral status or some sort of autonomous status, would the Russians have to take the bridge down? Because that still interferes with shipping uh, major large ships in and out of Azov Sea. So 
I don't I don't think there is an easy solution um, as long as Russia is your negotiating partner. Thank you, Willow. Um, we have a couple questions about Poland. Do you think that Poland's borders are at risk given its military support of Ukraine? They would have been at risk if Ukraine failed, without a doubt. And I think you would have a hard time finding any Poles that don't believe that. Um, you know, they've got a few hundred years of history with Russia. And so, um, you know, they are growing their military as fast as they can. They're modernizing as well as expanding the size of the military. Uh, they can't get enough Americans in there. You know, it's already kind of our center of gravity on the ground for Eastern Europe. Um, so I, I think that uh, they would be very concerned if if Ukraine had not stopped Russia. Uh, and they already are, of course, are playing a huge role as, as Poland uh, by being the uh, the hub, the pass through area where all the equipment that the nations are providing comes to southeastern Poland and then is uh, is shipped into uh, Ukraine. So they're they're very concerned. I would anticipate that the Poles will um, come up with some sort of a, um, I don't want to call it a security guarantee, but a, a very active relationship that's more than just neighboring European countries. And I think Poland will be an advocate for NATO membership as well as EU membership. Um, so that's so yes, their border would absolutely be uh, at risk if Russia had been successful uh, overall in Ukraine. And, and they still have Belarus there that they have to to worry about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jess. Would, do you have another question? Yes, of course. Um, there were a couple questions about the possibility of mutiny among the Russian armies. So is there real risk to Putin from a mutiny, a mutiny among Russian, Russian troops in response to the ongoing meat grinder? This is a uh, uh, another, all of these are excellent questions, uh, Klaus. I don't know if you wrote these questions yourself and they've been planted here, but I mean- these No, no, are, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, these are uh, really good questions. Um, there have been multiple reports of local level units refusing to fight. Uh, they tend to be uh, recruited from the areas way out in Eastern Russia, as I mentioned earlier, because they show up and they are, they are improperly equipped, um, which we all knew would happen because the Russian system could never, there was so much corruption that they would never be able to properly equip these newly mobilized uh, conscripts. Um, and, and they are being fed into a meat grinder. I mean, it's, it's a brand new private can see that his life is going to be about, you know, till the end of the day, um, the way that they're being pushed in there. And uh it's just the part of the problem is that they don't have much recourse. And uh, for, I mean, what can they do about it? And, and you know, the, the Soviets were famous for having NKVD uh, sections that were, were behind the attacking Soviet units, you know, to make sure that they didn't turn around and run. So uh, they've relied on this kind of brutality for a long time. Um, I saw a... Uh, a report the other day of a unit. Uh, I mean, they videoed themselves. Uh, they were from Tuva, which is an area in the southeastern corner of Siberia. It's one of the two areas, along with Borachia, that has the highest mortality rate, highest number of soldiers killed uh, per 100,000 um, of any other republic. And they were getting shot at by other Russian units. So you've got a there's an Islamic um, or a uh, religious bias as well, where the Orthodox based units uh, have such disdain for uh, Muslim troops from Russian Federation forces too. So I don't know that it'll be something like 1917 where hundreds of thousands drop their weapons and walk home. Um, but it doesn't look to me that they've got the necessary sort of morale, fighting spirit, and leadership to keep them together as it continues to get worse on their side. Thank you. Let me just ask you quickly, who actually blew up the Nord Stream pipeline? Seymour Hirsch, a you know, very well-respected journalist, claimed in a recent big article, the Americans blew it up. 
And of course, in the United States, they point the finger at Russia and the Russians uh, blew it up. So the motive, the motive really seems to be, or the reason seems to be more weighted with the Americans. Why would the Russians blow up the Nord Stream pipeline? Well, I had heard it was a University of North Carolina chemistry student that um, was involved somehow, but uh, of course, I completely reject your uh, your jab there. Um, what possible motivation would the United States have for doing this? And Seymour Hirsch, who is a you know long-standing, well-known, well respected journalist, but also known for some um, spectacular headline-grabbing pieces that don't always bear out. And I think he had one source that he used. And um, so, I mean, I that that piece probably got more attention than it deserved. But I cannot answer your question, who did do it? I mean, who would benefit from it the most? The decision uh, for nations moving away from Russian gas had already happened um, for most nations. Uh, and I could envision a Russian motive being to, because this was still relatively early uh, in this special military operation, a, a desire to remind other European nations that their infrastructure was vulnerable. But other than that, I, I mean, I can't, I, I, I can't come up with a real plausible uh, and certainly no proof of who it was. I think one thing is sure, the Germans didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that, that's probably uh, as good as any gets. <laughs> Willow, can we have another question? <clears throat> Certainly. Um, so we have a couple questions about the uh, China and about China and the Sino-Soviet um, relationship. Um, we know that China has refused to condemn the Russian invasion. Um, do you see this as kind of a pledge towards the continuation of the Sino-Soviet relationship? Well, of course, the Sino-Soviet relationship ended back in 1991, I think. But the uh, the Chinese-Russian friends without limits relationship apparently does have limits because I think that President Xi, during the visit of Chancellor Schultz to Beijing, said that uh, uh, Russia should not use nuclear weapons, nor should they threaten to use nuclear weapons. I, I thought that was very powerful. That was another reason why I have been pretty uh, confident that Russia would not use it because China is telling them you cannot do this. I, there will be zero positive outcome for China if Russia were to use a, a, a nuclear weapon. Still, um, China is looking for ways to, how can they leverage this situation to their, to their benefit? They would love to see us fail, the collective us fail, and especially the United States in this. So I could see why they would be looking for ways to get help, ammunition, whatever, to Russia. Um, I suspect what we would not see is a boatload of artillery ammunition, but instead uh, electronic components that um, the Russians desperately need to replenish their precision weapons that they have been launching against apartment buildings. Um, if they were able to find a way to avoid sanctions um, by delivering certain electronic components, I'm pretty sure that they would do that. Um, or they may be supporting Wagner organization down in Africa um, as a way to um, have some influence in all of this. I don't know, I'm, I'm sure it's not a simple um, sort of situation. Um, but I think they also want to avoid US sanctions. I mean, there's a threshold there. I don't know where it is. I can only imagine that Secretary Blinken is talking to his uh, counterpart. Uh, about this. Um, and the Chinese, of course, you know, their their own economic situation is not terribly strong right now. And uh, I, I think the Chinese are probably uh, trying to find where the limits are. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, uh, Jess. Do you have another question? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we have a couple questions regarding your opinion on how long the war the war will last in its entirety and if American help is the only way to shorten it. So uh, I hate to give a it depends answer, but it absolutely does depend on on us, primarily the United States, but not only the U.S. If we decided that doggone it, you know, we need to get this done. Um, Ukraine has already stopped Russia with what they have. 
So it's no longer about just saving Ukraine. This is about can we can we help them win? If we did, then it could happen by the end of this year because I think Russia is in such a weak position, um, unsustainable position, at least for now. But if it does drag on for another couple of years, which it could, if we continue to only incrementally provide uh, what Ukraine needs, then eventually Russia will have uh, figured out how to make more of their own ammunition, how to solve some of their institutional problems. So I think, frankly, it's up to us. It could end this year. Crimea could be liberated by the end of this summer, by the end of August, but that depends on us. Why do you say end of August? Why are you so pretty precise about that? Yeah, that's a fair question. Um, I, I thought if um, the combination of a uh, land counteroffensive plus the um, uh, use of precision weapons at three months, June, July, August, would be enough time for them to make Crimea untenable, that the Black Sea Fleet would have had to have left. And then so many things would start happening. And I think you would start to see a, a, a cascading effect. And so three months um, also would be about as long as Ukrainian forces to sustain a land operation as well. Um, so that, that's probably, um, I'm sure I'll, I'll be found out here in, in a few months that, okay, well, it'll actually be middle of September or something like that. But uh, part of this is also my attempt to uh, to to get smart guys like you to, to challenge my, my timing because there is this um, kind of a mindset out there that there's no way Ukraine can defeat Russia. That's it. And I would say, well, actually, I think they can do it in the next six months if we do this, this, and this because I don't believe that the Russians have the ability to stay in the field. I think that their so-called offensive um, is gonna culminate by around May. And the Ukrainians can see that, just like the Ukrainians saw that the Russians were gonna culminate last summer, around August. And that's when they launched their counterattack, which liberated Kharkiv and all that other area in the month of September. So same kind of situation, I think, is, is very possible. Um, the Russian Black Sea Fleet is unable to do anything other than go out, launch missiles against um, um, apartment buildings. The Russian Air Force, think about this. In a year, the Russian Air Force has not destroyed one train or one convoy bringing equipment and ammunition from Poland to Ukraine. I mean, we spent months in 1944 uh, before the Normandy invasion going after the, the French rail network and the German trains to make sure that they were to, to make, to disrupt as much as possible and to minimize the Germans' ability to defend. The Russians have not been able, despite overwhelming numbers, have not been able to destroy one train or, or one convoy. I think this uh, points to some of their serious uh, weaknesses. But what you also say is that time seems to be on the side of the Russians rather than on the side of the Ukrainians. Is that if if it goes beyond this year, yes. Thank you, uh, Willow. Please. Um, you've mentioned failed deterrence as a cause of where we are today a few times. Um, does the American look like? Does the American government look like it's learned um, a lot from this conflict? Has our foreign policy towards other potentially aggressive actors changed, um, or will they change? Uh, so, one of the best things that's happened in the past year is that Senator Shaheen of New Hampshire and Senator Romney of uh, Utah together um, put forth bipartisan legislation requiring the U.S. government to have to develop a strategy for the greater Black Sea region. This is so important. And it's now the law of the land, by the way. So the government's got to come up with a comprehensive strategy that addresses uh, diplomatic efforts, uh, the information space, uh, and economic investment, as well as military or security um, policy. Um, this means this will force us to uh, fix our relationship with Turkey, Georgia, 
uh, help with Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova, and obviously Ukraine. So a comprehensive strategy for the region. That This is something that the U.S. government um, is finally getting around to do, to doing that's been needed. In the past, we've talked about Ukraine as if it was an island, Georgia as if it's an island, rather than a region that's knitted together and connected together by this, by this Black Sea. And so uh, I think this will be a positive outcome. I think the uh, right half an hour down the road from me here in Frankfurt, the U.S. has a new three-star headquarters called the SAGU, the Security Assistance Group, Ukraine, um, which is responsible for helping to modernize their military. This will be a part of that kind of long-term effort. Uh, warships going in and out of the Black Sea, of course, is controlled by what's called the Montreux Convention of 1936, which gave um, Turkey sovereignty over the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. And the treaty um, says that non littoral states, i.e., nations like the United States, Canada, UK, Germany, France, Italy, can only come up into the Black Sea through the Straits with the permission of Turkey. And it's for a very specific amount of time and a certain size warship. Um, this this is a uh, an important uh, treaty because it does give Turkey also the ability to keep Russian ships out um, during time of conflict. And the Turks, even though our Turkish allies are very frustrating, they have done this, and, and this is this has been important. So, so fixing our relationship with Turkey um, is will be an important part of the way forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Jess, please. Yeah, so since you just mentioned uh, the role of Turkey, what role do you anticipate for them when it comes to peace nego negotiations? I think that President Erdogan sees himself as the, the grand statesman of the region, that he does in fact have some sort of a relationship with Putin as well as uh, Zelensky. And he has tried to position Turkey as you know, this is their sort of area. Um, and he, he has had some success with the uh, um, the grain deal. You remember last fall that got the grain flowing again, although it is trickling. Um, he has kept Russian ships, at, new additional Russian ships out, but he's also kept all of us out as well. Uh, he has provided drones to Ukraine. Um He's been adamant that Crimea is part of Ukraine because of the concerns they have over how the ethnic Tartars have been treated there uh, by the Russians. Um, but they also have not been as helpful on some other things that I think they, they should have been. <clears throat> but I'm always reminded of a meeting I had with a Turkish staff officer uh, when I was living in Izmir and, and I went up to Ankara to talk to this uh, lieutenant general who was the chief of plans and policy for the Turkish general staff. This was back in 2013 or so. I said, uh, sir, how's it going? He said, Ben, I wake up in the morning. I've got Russia to the north, Iran, Iraq, Syria to the south, the Caucasus to the east and the Balkans to the west. It's a hell of a neighborhood. <laughs> And I kind of laughed and then I thought, oh my God, you know, on all of our maps, Turkey is down in the bottom right-hand corner of the map and every headquarters in Europe. But of course, when he wakes up in the morning, Turkey's in the middle of his map and it is a hell of a neighborhood. And so while I don't forgive any of the terrible decisions that the uh, Erdogan regime has made or how they treat journalists there and other things, we have not done a good job of appreciating their strategic concerns. And they have been a good, loyal NATO ally since 1952. Well, they're not letting Sweden and Finland into NATO right now. Right. And this this is classic Ottoman uh, using leverage for negotiation to get as much as you can out of it. Now, President Erdogan has a, um, and, and this is driving me crazy. I mean, obviously, Sweden and Finland should be already be in the alliance. But um, He's got a very, very difficult election coming up in Turkey. Um, if it had been a few months ago, he would have been defeated probably. And so um, he's doing what he has done for years, which is whenever things are going bad at home, to create external um, threats or problems. And so 
the idea that uh, Sweden, which is true, by the way, has a very large uh, Kurdish population and members of the YPG and the PKK openly there. So, he, you know, he's able to demonstrate to his own population that he's being tough on this terrorist organization. And so at some point, I think this will get solved. Uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg is personally working um, on this. And I saw yesterday that uh, Turkey's foreign minister, Chavush Olu, uh, is meeting again with his Swedish and Finnish counterparts. Um, I'm hopeful that this gets announced at the NATO summit in July in Vilnius. I think I feel very confident about Finland. I'm just not sure yet about Sweden. Thank you. We have got only a very few minutes left, perhaps a couple of questions before we end it for today. Uh, General Hodges was so kind to grant us 90 minutes, which is uh, uh, a long time already. So let's uh, go to the last two questions, perhaps. Willow, would you like to start? Yeah. Um, so should Ukraine win the war, whatever that may entail, um, what do you think the process of rebuilding might look like? Mm -hmm. So the estimates run from half a trillion to a trillion uh, dollars. I mean, this will be enormously expensive. All of you guys have seen video of what these towns look like, rebuilding infrastructure, uh, places to live. You know, all of this is, is going to be very expensive. And um, uh, But the European Union um, has impressed me um, with their, their rolling up their sleeves. I mean, they... They see the importance of this. And I think uh, on the U.S. side, I, I heard Senator Chris Murphy uh, back in October at an event, and he said, look, you know, we are, uh, you know, we're committed to helping Ukraine win, but I mean, the taxpayer cannot continue to do this. So I think the U.S. is going to expect Europe to pick up the majority uh, of the bill or else private investors. Um, but, you know, um, Germany, Japan, both were able to rebuild. Uh, Europe was able to rebuild after the war. And um, Ukraine has an incredible population. The women and men there, I mean, the resilience um, and, and their technological savvy. Uh, I think we're going to see a very, very strong Ukraine 10 years from now. Um, and I think all these people that have fought for so much they're going to have just about zero tolerance for corruption too. So um, it's, it's going to be a much better place uh, when all is said and done. Thank you. Jess, a final question, please. Sure. Um, do you think that the demilitarization of the Black Sea is a viable option as a result of an anticipated Russian defeat? Uh, why, I don't know why we would want to, why those nations would agree to demilitarize it. I mean, that freedom of navigation is not a gift. It's it's something that has to be enforced. And so if you don't have a, a naval presence out there um, to to do that, then um, you you lose an important um, uh, what's the right noun? It's a requirement for for trade. And then when you say demilitarize, does that mean just no military, no navy ships? Does that also include protection of your uh, of your uh, coastline, um, all of these different things? I'm not sure I would be in favor of something like that. I mean, every nation has the legal right to defend themselves. And so the idea that somehow the Black Sea could become a demilitarized zone would be pretty difficult to enforce. And I, I don't know that I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. There are many voices who say currently that's a war between NATO and Russia. It's a final answer. Do you believe there's something in that? Well, certainly this is the narrative that the Kremlin needs uh, because they cannot possibly tell their people that they have been hammered and crushed by Ukraine, which was supposed to be a corrupt group of uh, neo-Nazis. Um, so they've got to make it look like this is us against all of NATO. But for sure, every country in NATO, I think everybody except Iceland, um, is providing some sort of capability to Ukraine. So um, I, I don't think I could be honest and say, no, you, NATO is not involved with this, because of course we're providing intelligence. We're, the nations of NATO are providing support. 
but there are no NATO troops uh, on the ground. There are no NATO aircraft flying overhead. Um, we are providing them capability. Thank you very much, General Hodges. It has been a great pleasure. Your insights were stunning. Once again, we learned an awful lot, both uh, uh, analysis-wise and information-wise. So it has been really a great pleasure to have you here. I hope you gained something from our conversation and the many questions as well. And thank you very much for joining us today. It was uh, an incredible privilege for me. Um, uh, and, and your two teammates there, Jess and Willow, uh, and the questions that, that came in from outside. As I told you before we started, I I always like that part to hear so I can hear what, you know, other people are thinking about things. And it makes me always forces me just like the last question about demilitarization. I, it's not something I had thought about. So to have to kind of think through those things is helpful for me. And, uh, yeah, even though I've lost my voice now, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you very much again and of course thanks to willow and jazz for doing having done such an excellent job our next krasno event is actually about germany on the 23rd of march also at 2 p.m where we will talk about the global position the global influence of germany and of course olaf Scholz's site and wende and its implications for today thank you very much for uh to everyone for joining us we have had a very large and impressive international audience and last not least thank you general hodges for joining us today it was really very interesting indeed good night good night Bye -bye.